children, listeners, wildflowers of Canada and other developing countries north of, of, of America, listen to the Quickie Podcast. Uh, you know, number 100 with Aaron Draplin. Thanks. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to episode 100 of the Quickie Podcast. Damn, that feels good to say. I cannot believe we made it to 100, but we did. So thanks for coming along with us. I'm your host, Dave Hopkins, and before I get into this interview with a fantastic guest today, I have a couple of things I wanted to let you know about. The first one is Crop Cruise. Next year, 2020, is the fifth anniversary of CropCons, which was founded by my buddy Matt Dawson from episode 58, and they're celebrating that fifth anniversary by hosting the event on a cruise to the Bahamas called Crop Cruise. They have an amazing list of speakers, including today's guest, and actually another guest from from, uh, the Quickie Podcast, Mr. Scotty Russell from Perspective Collective. Cruise is taking place April 18th to the 22nd, and to sign up and find more information, head over to cropcons.com. This is going to be a dynamite event. There's very limited tickets available, so definitely go check it out. Every event for them sells out, so don't miss out on this wicked event. The next thing I wanted to let you know about is, um, as you probably heard as a regular listener, my background is in printing, and I love working with designers and branding agencies to help create amazing print and tactile experiences. So to help designers save some time by having to go back and forth with their printer when they're sending files in and make corrections or redoing anything, I created a quick reference guide on the top things to double check before sending your file in to print. So this guide will cover the most common things that are missed when even experienced designers send their files in for printing. So check that out. To get that free guide, head over to thequickiepodcast.com and you can pick that up for free there. All right, so my guest for episode 100 is a guy you might not have heard of before. He's fairly new to design, um, Mr. Aaron Draplin. We had an amazing interview. It uh, was titled The Quickie-ish because it actually went on for over an hour. So I split this interview into two parts, part one today, part two tomorrow. During part one of this episode, we talk about his creative childhood that included junking and going to garage sales with his dad. He tells us stories about that. We also get into why he originally moved out of northern Michigan to the west coast, to Oregon. We get into his first design job um, before he had even started doing design in snowboard magazines, which was sort of his first kick down the door into the design world. Um, And that story is one that he doesn't talk about very much, but uh, it's a great one, and I'm glad he brought it up for the Quickie Podcast. We also talk about how design is oftentimes better when it's kept simple and just functions and works. We get into a bunch of examples of that. And he tells us a story about a couple of tough spots he's been put in when the client goes into your designs and starts moving things around and changing the DNA of that piece and how to handle that. Guys, this interview is jam-packed and I love Aaron's personality. No BS. He gets right to it. So let's get right to this. Ladies and gentlemen, part one of my interview with Aaron Draplin. Here we go. Welcome to the Quickie Podcast, the daily interview show where we talk to graphic designers about their journey to the creative field, and we do it in 30 minutes or less. So, are you ready for a Quickie? Good morning, Mr. Aaron Draplin. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Do I have to talk really, really fast because it's called the quickie? Do I have to pack it all in and get it really thick? Yeah, that was a little bit too slow for the show. So if you could pick it up. <laughs> yeah, but this half hour shit, man, I'm nervous. Because, you know, I do like to do these things real long form. As in, you ask a very simple, succinct question, and I talk way too long. You know what my record is? My record is eight and a half minutes for one answer. And you know why? Because everyone thinks they're Ira Glass. I don't know what you I don't know what you got up in Canada. But down here, everyone thinks they're 
I don't know, Edward R. Murrow or something. And it's some kid in his dorm room asking me these questions. And he's got the personality of the edge of this desk I'm sitting at right now. And then I have to answer the question. And my record's eight and a half minutes. Anyway, all right, let's do it. Eight and a half minutes. That's amazing. It's just narcissism is what it is. It's like out of page out of Ron Burgundy's book. I'm not even mad. It's just gross. (laughs) Um, you know what? Because you sweet talked to me, I might give you an extra five minutes in the end here. So don't sweat it. But um, okay. so briefly, okay. tell the listeners about yourself. Well, my name is Aaron James Draplin. I am forty-five years old. I'm a graphic designer here in Portland, Oregon. Um, you guys have heard this before. You know, yeah, I, I make logos and um, I work on stuff for rock and roll bands, and I work on stuff from restaurants, and I uh, make field notes with Jim Kudal, and I'm in Skillshare videos. And I built a typeface called DDC Hardware. I'm just trying to think of all the initiatives, you know. Mm-hmm. Or we'll just say things that maybe, you know, generate a paycheck that I have to sweat. But beyond all those things that, you know, you have to deal with with taxes or something, there's a lot of other stuff that no one ever sees, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, mean, I guess they see the, you know, going on the road and talking about myself. They see the pop-ups and stuff. But there's also... You know, I just really love to make design, and I love to do it sometimes for no money and sometimes for, you know, friends or sometimes for just a donation. There's a lot of that that people don't see, um, and it's kind of even hard to talk about, but that that's something I'm kind of most proud of, you know, is, yes, I can go down the line and tell you this is what I do, and this is what you've seen, but there's always someone spoken things that are cool, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that's, I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I really, this has been just a study and trying to do this with a clear conscience uh-huh. and clear open heart and, and work hard and save money and, and 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 get ahead and try to do it you know ethically and and try to enjoy it that's like the main thing yeah mm-hmm. now on my show i've had nearly a hundred guests that i've interviewed And uh, I'd say 50% of them have looked up to you sort of as an inspiration to them. And the comment on why most of the time is because you are that you, you have a lot of integrity and that comes through in your social media and how you're connecting with your audience and you put your heart into it and you're a real dude. Um, So that's, I mean, I really appreciate that. I mean, first things first, what's up with the other 49? The other 49? Yeah, I don't know. They got, they, got, they got a problem? I'll oh. send them an email and say, what the hell? Well, what's, <laughs> please. You know, what's interesting is, I, first of all, I really appreciate that, of course. And it just feeds into my megalomania, um, of course. So thank you. But, you know, what's, what's what happens on the road is, you know, I I get there to something. And, you know, we'll say it's one of these conferences. Mm-hmm. They need a hand carrying some shit in, and I'll, I'll help them. And then they, you know, the guy says, hey, do you mind if you come out and you know, do this extra podcast or do this question or this kid wants to interview. I say, yeah, yeah, cool. Let me, let me finish my little, you know, uh, uh, bowl of fruit and shit in the back stage. And let me come out and meet the kids. And I'll spend the day with the kids. I, mm-hmm. Whatever. I'm out there. They're climbing on me. They're, you know, accosting me and, and we're, you know, whatever. And towards, you know, th- then I do my song and dance. And I, I do, I sell a bunch of shit at the merch table. And at the end of the day, we, you know, whatever, here's what'll happen. Someone will come up to me and say, you know, all of us speakers are standing there and someone will come to me and they'll say, Drap, we just, we just really, you know, you are the most authentic of all, you know, and there's like six other speakers standing there. (laughs) And it's like, what does that say? Because, you know, I I appreciate it, but it's like, I think people are all real, Uh uh, but sometimes real can mean they don't want to, they're not going to go over whatever their little contract dictated Mm -hmm. and then shit sucks. Yeah. And if that's real to them, well, that's weird, you know, because, man, you got, you just got your ass flown to Kansas City and you get to spend the night in a nice hotel and you get to hang out all day. It's not like you're chained to a – you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, people react to that stuff. But, I mean, I, I guess, the, you know, the, the, the most the, – the proudest answer I can give is I appreciate that, of course, but I'm trying to be exactly who I am, mm-hmm. who I sit behind at this desk working – and of course, when a microphone gets turned on, I try to be that same guy too because that's weird that it would be something guarded or a performance. And yes, when I go get in front of people, it's a song and a dance because I need to get through a list of things I want to tell people. Mm-hmm. You know, there has to be some choreography in there. You know, yes, you learn where the cymbal crashes go, and you learn, you know, what you know. I don't know, but the idea is this, and I try to stand behind this. If a kid 
knew of me from a Skillshare or a kid knew of me from some piece of media or this thing from your podcast. Mm -hmm. And then they met me on this and then they met me at Target, you know, in the parking lot. It is the exact same thing. Same you know? dude. Because that's because here's and I'm not going to name any names. I'll give some initials. I'll give some initials. But I've met it where it goes the other way, you know. And I'm not trying to sling mud, but that shit just freaks me out because it's like, wait a second, you were pretty cool on stage, but I gotta say you were kind of a dick otherwise. Mm -hmm. Do not be a dick to these kids. You know, this is what I'm thinking in the moment because we're in the backstage in this weird, weird. One in a not one in a million, one in one in seventeen thousand position where you get to, you know, you get to kind of withhold yourself or go and dive in with the kids, and it's like fuck that, just go out there and be who you, you know. Anyway, I don't yeah. know. I appreciate, I appreciate. It. Awesome. Um. So how long have you been officially freelancing as Mister Aaron Draplin before? Well, uh, yeah, I, I guess it would be really officially would have been two thousand four because mm -hmm. that's when I had my own, but. All the way back to probably '95, and and even at that point when I didn't have a computer, I was just doing illustration, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I had that in me, and at that time that was only hobby, right? It was yeah. it was like that's all I could really generate from this stuff, and it was so cool that you could, um, oh, I don't know how to say, it. You, use something that you like to do to get ahead. Mm -hmm. That. Those weren't mutually exclusive. Like if you put where I'm from, you put the time in, you have to give your time and you get some shit paycheck. And here was something where I could start to, I could draw or design a logo or make a board graphic or whatever it was before this, this is all before the computer mm -hmm. and then get a little paycheck for it. That was amazing. And it, it bit me in a really cool way because you have to understand up to that point, it was pizza jobs. It was, you know, working at a, uh, some, you know, on a, on a chairlift or something at a, at, a, you know, at a ski resort or something like that. It was that kind of stuff. You know, and that kind of leads into my, so the next question, which was getting directly to that is what were you doing before that? You were dabbling in freelance on the side and then made it official in 2004. But what were you doing before that? And in that we transition, snow, we were snowboarders. We were out West to be snowboarders and be with our buddies and skateboard and, um, I, of course, I was into art and bands and mm -hmm. seeing rock and roll up in Portland and stuff. But really, our, our focus was to be out there and to be in the mountains. And this is in Bend, Oregon, to be, you know, Mount Bachelor, to be snowboarders and to ride and to understand that culture and have a bunch of friends in it. And we did it and it was incredible. Um, and that whole time, this is before the computer, I, it was all analog. I could just sit and I like to draw, right? Mm -hmm. I was looking at the magazines and I was starting to get my stuff slowly into zines around Bend, Oregon, or get my stuff slowly into the hands of local little skate and snowboard companies and stuff around around uh, Bend, Oregon, or you know, a couple times up and down the West Coast, and just doing whatever the hell it took. But also, you know, what you have to understand is at that time, I didn't really even understand you could make any money. When 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 I started to make a little bit of money, you know, it was awesome. But I, I could always fall back on that it was just kind of fun to do. This is what I did with my free time, you know? It wasn't this pursuit where I already had a little degree under my belt. We would go snowboarding in the morning. We'd get back, and I would go to my pizza job. But somewhere in between there, I would find time to draw and make little illustrations and look at my heroes, which might have been, you know, um, I don't know at the time, rock and roll poster people or, uh, uh, you know, the, the records I, uh, records and CDs I was buying. I was always reading those liner notes and stuff mm -hmm. and then emulating. And, you know, what happened was a friend, you know, was at a uh, – I knew how to use computers because I had a little associate's degree. No one had one around me. They were expensive. But a friend went to a community college and we would sneak in and use his stuff to go use their, like, you know, I don't know, page maker on their mm -hmm. quads or whatever. And I don't know how old you are. How old are you? I'm 33. Must be nice to have <laughs> you on your side. At that time, you would have been about five. Anyway, uh, or whatever. But it's like this weird thing where it was like we would go use those things, and I got a bug with that. I could I could like use their stuff. You know, it was all it was one more tool. Now I could instead of having to hand letter my business cards, I could use their page maker to build my business card, print them out, hand cut them, hand. Uh, color them up and put them onto cardboard, whatever, onto chipboard or something, and then hand those out to my asshole friends, you know, <laughs> and get little jobs and little things. And 
um, you know, where it really exploded, you know, was I had my I, I always forget to talk about this, but I did have a design job before all the stuff, mm-hmm. you know, my, before my first real job, which was at a snowboarding magazine. It was at this thing called the Nickel Ads. And the Nickel Ads were like, you know, a rancher um, or, you know, some good old boy or whatever from Central Oregon could roll into the Nickel Ads. You got their car they're trying to sell outside. I go running out. I take a picture with this crude digital camera or <laughs> whatever it is. You know, I mean, Maybe it was just real film. Someone drops that film off later on. I get it back a day later. I have to scan that in, clean out their car, and the root, you know, the basic Photoshop at the time, uh-huh. and then build an ad. And then that ad goes in amongst other little, you know, tiny little one ads and stuff. And then if you paid extra cash and your car is actually shown, or your big rancher um, trailer, you know, from a big, you know, cowboy cat behind a big cowboy Cadillac is shown, you're going to sell your shit. So um, I worked at a thing called the Nickel Ads for about eight months. And that was my first graphic design job. But see, there, if I'd work all day, they'd let me work a couple hours on their machines. And that's really where I started to kind of get, like, fluent again, you know, having a machine to use for my own logos and things and stuff. That was was 1996. That summer, I went up to Alaska and um, I uh, made 10 grand in the summer of 96, made 10 grand and brought it back in the fall. And bought my first computer, and it's it's just been ape shit ever since. Because then I had the tools. Yeah, exactly. I want to dive a little bit back further than that, and I want to ask you about your childhood. So this is usually where the counseling session starts, and I start billing you. Okay. Um, but tell me about your childhood, what that was like. Do you feel that you had a creative childhood that led you down this career path? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a cool mom and dad. I have a cool mom and dad. My, we, we lost my dad. Yeah, you probably heard that shit. We're saving a lot on groceries. These are the jokes I use to <laughs> smooth myself. Oh, he was a horrible person. Now that he's gone, we can really let the truth out. No, I, I had a, my dad was awesome. I hate using the word was. He is awesome. He's yeah. everywhere. He's in, he's in you right now. He's deep up inside you right now and me right now. You're in, up in the can. I'm here. It's, that, that's my dad. But, uh, my mom, you know, still around. I, they were just really cool, you know. They, they there was the the battles that kids have, sure, but my mom and dad weren't, you know, necessarily no people. They were like, well, if you're going to be a yes, if this is a yes, we have to figure out why, and we have to figure out what the budget is. And we have, you know, like my mom was really good at like uh, pluses and minuses, you know. Like, mm-hmm. okay, if you're going to go now. Here's what you need to remember, and if you're going to do this, here's what you got to think about. So I had that. It wasn't just this. You're not doing it because I said so. None of that kind of arbitrary shit. Mm-hmm. They were cool people. They were ex hippies, and they were liberals, and they were you know progressive in the way you know with their friends and the way that they voted. And I was I, I was raised on that. But you know beyond that, in our home, my dad was a master junker and a Polish pack rat and a woodworker. And my mom, you know, was always um, you know knitting baskets. And had different hobbies and crafts and things over the years um, that we were around. So it'd be tools and stuff and spools of thread and yarn and shit. And we were around that stuff. And then, of course, we had our own too. So we were in a you know a creative family. Like I remember them taking us to like um um our, uh what do you call it like an art show? What do you call it? Art, art like an art, art gallery. Art. To art fairs. Okay. And, you know, there would be local craftspeople, you know, artists and shit selling everything from wood art to paintings to riffraff. And we would go support that stuff, you know. And my parents, you know, were, you know, we were raised around antiques. So there was like this big appreciation for like, your dad went and found this for nothing, cleaned off a hundred years of paint. And now when we have it in 1980, it's, you know, it's brand new to where it was in 1880, but here it is in 1980, and it's new, and this is what we use. I was raised around an entire house of that shit. That's so there's cool. like this weird appreciation for like, yeah, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Or, you know, this actually is, is this works enough, you know. And yet, as just another little bit of contrast, I had an uncle who I would kind of call a modernist who had – you know, sort of an, um, an appreciation for Eames furniture and an appreciation for that sort of mid-century um, modern 
Um, oh, uh, just sensibility. Mm-hmm. Everything from his handwriting to he was an engineer to some of the furniture in their home was just enough to, for me to see coming from this very uh, kind of rural northern Michigan mm-hmm. down to Detroit and getting this taste of the high life, you know, just a little bit. So I knew the contrast. When we moved back to my house, it was an old farmhouse that my dad fixed up. When we went to my Uncle Tom's, it was this cool, crisp, modern home that had these incredible angles and, you know, uh, uh, floor to ceiling glass on one end, right? And, you know, I remember as a little kid, like you could feel the winter coming through that glass, but it was a design decision, right? Mm -hmm. It felt premium to me. So, you know, I had those influences all the way back. Yeah. So have you then become a collector yourself from that, taking that? Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, I was around it. My dad used to mess with us because, you know, when you're 11, that's the last thing you want to do is have to go to some antique mall or uh, a flea market and walk those lanes. But my dad used to make it fun. And he'd say, hey, hey, this is the one kid. The, hey. you know, he knew whatever I was into air. This is the one. We're going to walk down this lane. There's going to be a box of Star Wars shit. It's going to be five bucks for the box. <laughs> You're going to double up on your Yodas and shit. Aaron, this is the one. And you know what? You know, 14 years old, Aaron, some kid ran away from home. He went to California. He got to California. He was a skateboarder just like you. He had skateboards and things and stuff, and he died in California. And then, was, you know, they had to send all of it back to his parents here in Michigan and at this garage sale, and you never know. This is the one that has a box of that shit for a buck. We got to go look. And, all right, and we go look, and there was never shit. So he he'd psych fun. you up for it. Oh, he'd get me all excited. So there, that was fun. You know, I mean, what I'd give to take my, you know, to go. Listen, we went junking a lot. You know, I mean, but, it, you know, I, I miss that because that's in me now. Mm-hmm, and now yeah. I do that to my nephew who, you know, nine and doesn't want to go. Or to my girlfriend if she's had too much for the day. And it's like, come on, this is the one. Yeah. You know, and. You know, as a funny little story, uh, years ago, I guess about seven years ago, I was back home visiting my mom and dad in Michigan, and we're driving, you know, Cedar Run Road back out to where my parents live, like we, you know, they had done, you know, my mom's been there, you know, coming up on 25 years, and mm-hmm. like they had done for years, and um, you know, but you know, as the back of your hand, you go around this one corner, there's this little garage sale sign, and my dad just gives me, <laughs> come on, I know you want to get back and lay on the couch, you know, and whatever, work on your projects. Because I would get, I would go home and I would sit at their, you know, their, their dining room table and work and just command what I needed you know, to work on, right? Mm-hmm. And my dad gives me the eye, hey, come on, asshole, we got to go. This is <laughs> the one. I mean, Aaron, what do you, you're, this is the one. It's going to have wreck. We, we park, we walk in, sure as shit. We walk up and he just points at this stack of records. He goes, I told you so. And there's... Bob Dylan, the freewheeling Bob Dylan, on the top of the stack, super clean copy for a buck. Oh and that's probably gosh. 60 70 I don't know, whatever, it's some version. You know, it's that kind of magic. That is in me. That is in me. And also folly. You know, my dad also, the humor of, like, pulling up on something and being like, you know, this is another great story. You know, uh, by the way, this is turning into the Criterion Collection here. Um, we're driving back from Detroit, and my dad, you know, we, we go to Gas Up in West Branch. That's halfway. Okay. So we have two and a half more hours to go. And my dad, we're going to Gas Up and, you know, maybe hit a, you know, a, a McDonald's or some shit. He's going to keep me fed or, you know, you get to have some, you know, salty fast food because we're not back home or when you're around your mom and shit and we're on the road together. And I don't know, I'm. I'm 14 or 15 or some shit, Stone High School, and we see a little sign, and he goes, hey, we got to go. Come on. We're, we got two more hours. We got to go. Let's just go see. So we, we drive off the I-75 in, in Michigan, and then we drive you know, off the highway down some country road a, a couple miles. Then we see another sign, and we turn down some dirt road, and we got to go three miles on a dirt road, and then you get to some little cul-de-sac. Oh, I got, there's the last sign, and we pull into the cul-de-sac, and we got to worm around this cul-de-sac, and then he finds the last sign, and we pull up into the driveway, and he stops in the driveway and just goes, fuck, baby clothes. <laughs> so <laughs> just, don't, even, don't even get out. Just don't. Don't even just shut up. Don't touch nothing. Don't even just go. And he puts it in reverse and we back out and we get to that last little turn into their driveway and he drives back out. But 
you get to the edge of their cul-de-sac before it turns into the country road or whatever the fuck, and he stops, er, jumps out of his little minivan, goes running out to that you know second-to-last sign, grabs the sign, whips it off into the brush, you know, flying through the air, and he gets back in the car and he goes, "We got two more signs to go. We're going to save this whole community from that pile of shit." <laughs> baby closed yard sale and we destroyed all the signs all the way back to I-75 and then drove back to, to uh, you know, uh, Travis Commission. Anyway, true story. That's hilarious. So in that transition while you guys are doing junking and you're looking at garage sales and all of that, is, was there a moment that stands out to you where you first started noticing graphic design like out in the world? What did you first start seeing? Well, that goes way back. And I think what that is, it, 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 it's due to limitations we didn't – I never really knew that we didn't have a lot because I had a good mom and a dad. I had a little sister, and we had you know, a little baby sister. Um, um, there was my, we, there, I had two little sisters, and my dad used to say, I have three kids, one of each. You were, you know, we, we never really knew we didn't have a lot. So when I got a box of Legos, it was really kind of a special thing for a birthday or Christmas or something from Santa or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like – I remember how crisp and beautiful. The, I mean, we'd see them when we go to stores. And I would. I remember getting little boxes, you know, of course. But you know, if it's like a Christmas, you got a, you know a big spaceship or you got a fire truck set or whatever it was. And mm-hmm. I remember the typography on the boxes. It looked like the type art, which was Helvetica. It looked like the Helvetica that you saw on when my mom and dad would buy these. Like, if you've heard of Dansk. And dance were, you know, sort of the Scandinavian, um, like accessible modern cups and you know stuff. Yep. And dance did a version of like the you know the 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 the, the Vignelli Heller Knoll stuff. They did a version of that somewhere at the dance store. You could get that stuff. Yellow plastic, orange, green, pop colors. This is 1981 or 80, and awesome spatulas and shit. My parents had a couple sets of that stuff. Those were splurges. But I remember. The quality of what the packaging looked like then when you went into that store, everything, it was this crisp, modern, Helvetica bold. And that reminded me of, of, of my Lego boxes. And then the next thing I would have seen when I'm seven years old, would have been or eight years old, was the Helvetica on the side of the space shuttle. Uh-huh. And that was this crisp, modern, futuristic thing. And it, it grabbed me. What it, what it meant was... These are special things like, you know, Aaron, keep your box. Look how cool the box is. You know, I remember my dad, you know, we keep the box. You know, and I was, because we didn't have a lot of that shit around, it really stood out. Because, you know, at the mercy of whatever, you know, imports and ex- whatever the hell that was coming into northern Michigan, it, there was a certain look. I remember when we would go over to Sault Ste. Marie or we would go over to Windsor, you know, Things would change, and what you got a taste of, it wasn't this bullshit American exceptionalism like we're the we don't need to you know we do our own thing. Mm-hmm. No, you got to see things from the rest of the world. So candy suddenly looked cooler, and GI Joe guys had cooler um, guns and cooler colors, and everything was in French. You know, and all was weird. It was exotic to me as this little rat kid from northern Michigan. But I was looking at that. I was looking, you know, and the beer labels looked different because they were tapping into the world. Um, so now I want to ask Aaron through all of these amazing things that you've seen in your design life and your, your career so far, what stands out as the most influential design you've come across? Maybe it's something you've been a part of even. The most influential design that I've come across. Oh man, that's a bit, I mean, I, I, I read your questions and stuff. I, I thought a little bit, I mean, I think it's a very, probably a bit of an obtuse answer. But okay. it's more about the things you don't realize. That's really powerful to me. So let, let me just say like this, something like this. It has to do with Canada. When you go across the border and you see American custom forms, and then you go across the border into Canada and you see, you know, when you guys come towards us and you see our customs forms and we go over to you guys, the power of your system, it's easier to read because it has to work for, you know, the Quebecois, and it has to work for the sort of like, I don't know, it's just that license to have order was just how typography works. That's mm-hmm. something that I always loved about Canada. 
And I always loved about when you go to Europe. Now, the first time I went to Switzerland, it was so fun for me just to go into like a, a supermarket and to look at like the simplest, the simplest of toothpaste and shit. And sure, they're under the same pressures as us to make it look, you know, better than the next Procter & Gamble product, you know, which mm-hmm. would be, like, I don't know, Aquafresh or some shit. But, but the thing is, is some of the really root base stuff was just out of a, a, a simple design system. And it was simply about clarity, about transparency of, of the data. And this is, these are the ingredients that go into this thing. They're easy to read. And there was a democracy to that. And I just, that's the kind of stuff that really gets me. And, and you know, you don't, of course, now you see it with some, some materials for some kick-ass uh, 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 um, piece of furniture or something. Mm-hmm. Because it's a motif that kind of goes with, like, you just bought this special thing, and here's what the materials talk about this special thing say. you know. And it's this cool thing, and it all feels really crisp and modern, and that becomes a design solution to elevate something. But it used to be this thing just for clarity, mm-hmm. and I love that stuff. I love, you know, I love seeing that. You know, that's not just 1980 when I was you know, sort of starting to look at things or 1989 when I was like, wow, this record cover looks a little bit different than this for this reason. It's more like if you go back and you look at, you know, the, the sort of the agrarian landscape of America and you look at farmers and the things that I love so much about that, the type and the memo books and the signs and the feed and seed, you know, logos and graphics. They were just purely no bullshit. They just were meant to work. And that functional freedom is something that I, I would hope you would see in my work or in my type or in my things just to let something rest and be as it is. And, you know, if you look at our field notes, it's just Futura Bold. That is a reaction only because I saw things like – for instructions that mm-hmm. did the exact same thing and fuck it was readable it was readable and it was this is the thing it's like you're not buying instructions you're buying the lawnmower but how do you put the lawnmower together that device and that kind of now it looks like a kind of a retro thing no that device of that kind of one typeface used this way with proper hierarchy it worked and that's the stuff i like i like the things that are time tested you know, I, I try to use that in my own work. Mm-hmm. I try to learn from that shit. I try to exhibit that stuff, but I rest on that stuff because you, know, you I, I, when I came into this stuff, I just was reading something. St- Stephen Heller called it the, the, the war on legibility. And isn't that fun? Isn't that fun to say that now? But was Stephen Heller making that shit back then? Maybe he wasn't. But there were people making a lot of shit in 1995 where it was all scritch and scratch and puke on a page. And I don't know if you remember this stuff, but it was just kind of horse shit, you know? And it was really highfalutin. And I remember trying to make it and feeling like a total poser. Mm-hmm. And I remember, you know, of course... We're going to do that as a culture of artists and things. You know, the computer allows us to go this far now, and we're going to do it. You know, the damage of communication. But here's the thing: I remember getting magazines, and it would have been damaged in this, you know, in the name of fashion, and you couldn't read the fucking article. That sucks. That Definitely. sucks. Definitely. You know. So, so, uh, yeah, I'm right and they're wrong. Next question. <laughs> I really like how you touched on the Switzerland supermarket, even just looking at basic food packaging. Um, because when my wife and kids and I went to Ireland and Scotland just a few months ago, um, walking into our first supermarket over there, um, I spent a good half an hour at least until I was pulled away from it, just looking at the packaging Great. and the different design and just how it was presented and felt different than um, you know what we had experienced before. Well, or, or just the idea of like when I went to Guatemala, uh-huh. we're really lucky as North America, whatever North America, you know, Canada, sure, same same as America, whatever. Um, Careful now. Well, I mean, <laughs> I just, here's the deal. I, well, I know, but you you go to your fuck. What do you got? I don't know. Your Queen's Majesty's Royal Corner Supermarket, and you get to dig through. How many different kinds of soda pop? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. How many different kinds of cereal? And it's like, wow, we have variety here. What a privilege that we abundance have. Abundance of variety. We have abundance here. And we have so many things to pick through. And you have so many options. And when you go buy a car, you get to do this. But when you go to like a Guatemala, it's there. 
but there is a quality of like, this is the one to get. And this is just the one you get and we all grab it. And, you know, what does that packaging look like? Because it's not competing. Like, you know, remember years ago, the little, I don't know what you can call it, a meme or a little viral something you click on. And it showed how, you know, uh, Windows was just so populated with horseshit trying to make Apple look bad. Mm-hmm ended up with 94 things on their packaging and then you have an apple package which is white with a little silver apple and it just a hit of this I don't know, apple watch or whatever that confidence that that fuckery of design where you trusted i mean at least in my case i trusted that apple because it felt premium and it felt yes. confident. You didn't need to come and say x2000 have holograms there was some little thing that you could click on and show how they would you know murder their software packaging and there's something about that when you see it stripped of all of that competitive capitalist bullshit you just get down to the root and that's where i was really and listen this is a weird one but i was equally inspired and fucking terrified the first time I went to Berlin and started to really look at the old DDR packaging of, you know, before the, you know, before the wall went down, uh, what their shit looked like over, you know, in East Germany. And it was terrifying mm-hmm. because it was state sponsored. And that's what happens when there's someone, pull, you know, controlling the purse strings and saying, you only get this much <laughs> bread and shit, you know, and, and here's what this is state sponsored sugar and this is what it looks like because you know what's interesting is that stuff is beautiful to me it's really hyper functional and what little they could do to make i don't know a, the the minimal treats that people were allowed to have look fun they did it but there was an ominous quality to it and it's like really weird to me when i when i see that stuff it's like you know i don't know that's the stuff i think about when i'm working do i do i have to be careful that um um Am I am I sprinkling too much shit on this just to be frivolous or fashionable? <laughs> yeah. When you know what I I kind of want to dip at least start in the functional and then work my way up and just do a little sprinkle of the of the other f words, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something that I think about all the time. And that came from being in the middle of nowhere, and it came from an appreciation of shit that just works, you know. And still to this day works. I mean, that's the interesting part about this. It's one thing for me big goddamn beast of a man whatever to wax about this stuff but if you go right now and land in nebraska in omaha and drive 10 minutes in any direction and get out of the city and get to the first cornfield the first cornfield outside of vancouver the first cornfield outside of portland chances are there's a little sign there that says this kind of feed is used in this field and that is graphic design and that shit's awesome and you can see it from a mile away like a train trains are reminders of how logos need to work because mm-hmm. you can see them across the field and go oh yeah there's the, the burlington northern whatever you know you can see it that is pure functional working graphic design that's oh, shit so well we said really well functional being the word well i know but see here's the deal Am I an asshole for thinking people who only work in the fashion are weird? Kind of. I, I, get, I mean, the answer is they are fucking assholes. And I guess I am too. But that shit scares me because sometimes that's the only place they can go. And then when you challenge them and say, make this work for people who can't afford it, they don't know how to do that stuff. And that shit scares me. And I don't know what that even means. You know, when I work in a restaurant, I, I, it's not to say, wow, this is only for the working class. Let's get something real straight. Before you ask me about being blue collar, there's nothing about what I do. That's I'm, I have a tax manager. I have a money market account. I have things I don't even know what they mean. Return <laughs> on investments and all sorts of and things. And I have savings and I have you know people tracking things and circling wagons and getting back to me and missing emails and you know all this shit to help me with what I save because I saved all my shit. You know, and and that's not very blue collar. Blue collar is working the rest of your life on, you know, on shit that's small, small little things. And, you know, people will say, well, you're a blue collar designer. It's like, fuck, man. No, I'm not. I, I got out of that shit. I know what it's like to, to have nothing. And I worked my ass off to get away from that. This is pretty white collar now. I mean, hopefully the DNA is still there or the, or the idea is. And this is within persnickety, sweaty ass little graphic design. But if I go to a press check. I don't thumb my nose down to the people spitting out your prints. 
I know how to be nice. I know how to be accommodating. Mm -hmm. I've said it just enough to where someone had the audacity to think that they elevated themselves out of those sort of work in person sorts of jobs and they're kind of snapping their fingers at, you know, the people that are like pumping out the prints. <laughs> that's how you fuck your print job up, number one. And number two, that's just not how you work. My dad was a, was a tool salesman. Mm -hmm. And my dad would go into these tool shops and he would, you know, make his way through the back of the shop. Hey, he knew all these guys. He'd go up to the front. He would, is, is, is so-and-so in? I'll be up there in a couple minutes. He'd run to the back and he'd talk with all the guys. Bullshitting, telling jokes, mm -hmm. bringing them little things. You know, hey, how's your, how's your kid doing? My dad knew all these things because he grew up with these guys. When all that 97% bullshitting was done, he saved the final 3% to go up to the guy who ran the place, who looked like he was running the place, who wasn't funny. He looked stressed. Had some shitty mustache. Remember, this is like Take Your Kid Today, 1983. I'm 10 years old or, you know, whatever, 11 years old, 1984. Mm -hmm. The guy isn't funny and he doesn't want to hear my dad's jokes. My dad does his business and he gets the hell out of there. But my dad knew how to talk to every single guy in that place. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Be one of them. Because he was one of them. My dad worked in factories and shit. It's that building and fostering community, whatever your community is. Building, fostering, being a part of that. And, you know, almost use the word mentoring that community. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I just, I just appreciate – listen, I know that what I get to do sometimes is a little persnickety, and yes, but if you come and you work with me, I will reduce it down to this thing where it's as if we were working a summer job together and we had to, we had to get each other in it mm -hmm. and get each other out of it. And that isn't something that I get to – you know, I don't know how to say it. It's like I just – the the main battle doing any of this stuff is to be comfortable. I watch my dad make people comfortable. You know? Yes. And, that, and that's the same thing here. And it's like, you know, when I have to deal with the client, that isn't necessarily the 3% because I've worn them down or I've allowed them to be with me. You know, I've allowed them to just, I don't know how to say it. Like, this is going to sound horrible, but I just did a big job for a guy. And in one of our final phone calls, and take this for what you want, he probably knows, has an idea of how I talk with my buddies. And I don't want to sound like some big, dumb, gorilla, dumbass dude, you know, saying horrible things. But he said something to me about ball sweat. He, <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, like, first of all, now you get me going with my buddies and we get going about, you know, I'm sponsored by Gold Bond. I'm going to issue a Gold Bond alert for the better part of, you know, the Atla greater Atlanta area, Tri-County area, because you go down there and you sweat like a science project. OK, whatever. But the deal is, we're on the phone. I have kept an air of professionalism. I know people are going to roll their eyes when they hear that trap and you, 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 what are you, gorilla? Well, hold on. He doesn't know that. And then when he said this to me, I kind of laughed at him. I said, oh, you don't want to pull that. You don't want to pull that. You don't want to pull the curtain back on that shit, man. Really? Okay. Now I know where we're at. If that's how you talk, then we're just fine. Because at that, up to that point, that was a service I would never, ever breach that sort of trust. You know, what if he was some, you know what I mean, like Bible banging Christian, whatever the hell. Oh yeah, and you come out and drop far, an f bomb or something like far that. Far from it. Oh no, he we, we got past that shit pretty quick because he. <laughs> I let him do it. You see what yes. I'm saying? I let him do it. I watched my dad do the same. And, and, and you know, if you're around these good Christians and, and you say the word fuck and you watch them react like that well you don't need to be the person to do that you know it's mm -hmm. there's ways of you know feeling around and, and 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 you know whatever and i watched my dad do that and be accommodating and make people comfortable that is no different working on a big 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 job or you know when i was working on a couple days ago where a guy is a construction guy in town who just wrote me and said i probably can't afford you but it, it's a long shot i just wrote him back i'll have it done today man i like your work I love your, your your sort of moxie for reaching out to, you know, this to me, thinking I'm some big hot shit thing because I'm not. I'm one of you. But, you know, uh, you sure there's some high profile shit that you've seen to make you say that. But now we're on the phone together. It's just me. Hi, let's do it. And then yep. I got you know, made a couple grand. It was awesome. We're all working hard humans, right? Yeah. So I want to ask you a little bit about print design because through your Instagram, I've seen a fair amount of print in your feed, which I really dig. I'm a print guy at heart. And that's where I'm going to cut part one. Thank you so much for listening to part one of this interview with Aaron Draplin. 
Um, And I wanted to just say something else here. Getting to 100 episodes definitely would not be possible without you guys and gals and you very talented designers and you, you listeners that have sent me emails, have left reviews on iTunes and things like that, and that my amazing guests who come onto the show willingly, a little bit nervous, the Quickie Podcast, what the hell is this guy all about? And then we have a great conversation. Thank you to all of my guests um, from episode one to episode 100, where we're at right now. Um, I really appreciate the time that you took out of your busy schedules to be a part of this. This project really just started as something that was exciting to me, something new, something different where I could connect with more designers, hear more stories, and have fun talking just sort of outside my network, you know, my Vancouver bubble here. And it's done that and so much more. I cannot wait for the next 100. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so great. And we've got some big plans to bring some really cool new things and some shocking and exciting things to the show. So thank you for investing your time and being a part of the Quickie Podcast as a listener, as a guest, as a fan, and emailing me. I I love the feedback. I love the reviews. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as I usually end most of them, guys, have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning and welcome to episode 100, part two of the Quickie Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Hopkins, and if you haven't listened to part one of this interview, definitely go back and check that out. Part one was where we talked about Aaron's childhood and his journey to the creative field. He tells us some stories as well that he doesn't really talk about. His very, very first job before he started getting into you know, graphic design for snowboard magazines and that's when it started to take off for him. But he tells us about his very first design job and it's not that glamorous. He tells that story part one. So definitely go back and check that out. That's when leads into this part two. Part two here, we get into some of the client stories, the the rough times he's had with clients, the challenges he's faced in his career, and also projects that he's the most proud to be a part of and why. It's awesome. I love hearing his stories. He gets right into them. So let's get to it. Go back, check out part one if you haven't done that yet, and then come over here. But here we go anyways. Part two of my interview with Mr. Aaron Draplin. Here we go. Welcome to the Quickie Podcast, the daily interview show where we talk to graphic designers about their journey to the creative field, and we do it in 30 minutes or less. So, are you ready for a Quickie? So, I want to ask you a little bit about print design because through your Instagram, I've seen a fair amount of print in your feed, which I really dig. I'm a print guy at heart, I have a huge cool. passion for printing. Um, I want to know how or ask you how you've been utilizing print in your design career um, and your maybe some recent interactions you've had with print and what you liked about it. Well, I miss it. I can tell you that much. Um, you know how I used it. Well, I used it to pay pay my house off. I made magazines for years and um, snowboarding magazines, and of course catalogs for these different snowboarding brands and headwear brands and um, um, things and stuff. And I know my way around the grid. You know, I, I will say probably unfairly, but um, listen, with having people looking at you, first of all, there's no written. Set of privileges that says, you know, say, wow, man, it's a set of privileges just to have people look at your shit. And then, how dare I think that everyone's going to like it? Every now and again, there's some, you know, pecker wood that, you know, just has to come after me and say, that guy's a one trick pony that draft and talks a lot. He's whatever. He's got a face of a pit bull, blah, blah, blah. Oh, he's big. Let's go after him for that. Oh, that's real. That's real creative. But when they come after me for my type chops, I start getting pissed, right? Because mm-hmm. He hasn't seen my book that respects some of those principles. He, there's no way that little puke, you know, who's just pissed off that my poster might be out selling his. And by the way, that's going to change at some point, buddy. And then you can sell more posters and whatever, however it goes. 
But he, he's never seen all the years of me toiling over, learning from, learning from. A friend and I were just talking about this the other day. My buddy works at a snowboarding magazine. And when I went and worked at these snowboarding magazines, I got to bring all this sort of print design hoo-ha I had just learned in college uh -huh. to dumbass snowboarding. And there was things like this. Do not make a paragraph that's over 54 characters. Do not hang a two or an an, an or an a. That's a, called a widow. You don't, you know, that that looks hard to read. It's hard to connect to the next thing. You got you to gotta read the shit and, and adjust it. That's called a river. The way these texts, you know, all those words are weird. Have the kid rewrite one sentence and it, it looks better. You know, these are tiny little things to adjust. Well, that's no different than what someone used to do, putting simple type med metal pieces next to each other and typesetting the type, typesetting type, you know, right? Mm -hmm. And actually have to manually touch it and kern it and look at it. And there was something special about how beautiful those things worked back then because crude, yes. But when I was working on print, I had this great appreciation who the predecessors who kind of get, set us all up and knowing what they went through and then how easy it was for me to do it. And then I better have a little bit of respect for some of the principles. So I used to think about that shit and sure, apply it to dumbass snowboarding or whatever it was. But man, some of our mags looked really nice, you know, and they worked. And it wasn't just about flash and like extreme sports or whatever the fuck that meant. It was more about like just, well, legibility, systems, and then being able to process the thing and enjoy the photo instead of competing with the photo. You, you can know? almost say function. Yeah, function. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I was looking, I wasn't looking at other snowboarding magazines. I was looking at wallpaper magazine. Mm -hmm. I was looking at, you know, when Monocle came out. Beautiful. I was looking at Idea magazine. But beyond that, I was going and looking at corporate manuals to see how they used to, you know, handle these large scale projects for big airlines and shit. Because mm -hmm. listen, here comes the C word. Here it comes, everybody. Corporate weird man that shit's weird and it's a bad terrible name and uh, 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 kind of category now and it's creepy and you know corporate this corporate that but no that stuff was really inspiring to me because it was like how do you take this big thing and give it some order that's a design problem mm -hmm. right and that's no different than when you sit down to a page i miss that aaron here are these 19 products and 19 price tags and 19 descriptions and you've only got you know, 11 spaces. All right, do it. I used to, I love that stuff because it's no different than building a website or, you know, building something with Legos and having to be efficient or something. Mm -hmm. I, I love that challenge of bringing function to something that almost just seems disorderly. I miss it. I miss it. And in fact, mm -hmm. I have a thing here. I'm going to start showing on my little Instagram. And I appreciate the nice words that you said about, you know, my little, my little output, but I, I, um, I have a series of grid explorations where I take something either, you know, that piece of shit in the White House said, horrific, and I, I, I quit doing that because that stuff is just so embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But I'll take some beautiful, you know, um, um, quote from a poet, and, and or, or I've been listening to a lot of Christopher Hitchens. It's very soothing to me, you know, these, you know, uh, empirical data. And how it can kind of beat back, you know, it's ag you know, agnosticism versus atheism versus, well, he calls it wishful thinking or just religion, you know. And, you know, which suddenly when you start to tear it apart in a scientific uh, empirical level, and I don't know if I'm even using the right words here, but it starts to become Easter bunnies and superstitions real quick, right, real quick. Mm -hmm. And I've been listening to this guy and it's like, okay, he just said something very profound. I'm going to take that paragraph and I'm going to build it into a grid and I'm going to go do that just as an exercise. I've got a bunch of these things I've been playing with because I miss that stuff. I don't really get to make print anymore. Um, it's rare. You know, it's rare because, first of all, I'm not making magazines. I'm not making catalogs. Those are commercial vessels that I get a paycheck for and then I do it. Um, but I am right now doing um, like um, some kombucha, hard kombucha labels. Yeah. And to go flex my, you know, flex my sort of type. Uh, muscles that I've, I'm proud to have, you know, I'm not the best, but I know my way around, you know, and I, who cares about who, who, the, who the best is on any front. It's more like I, I was taught some principles. I like to adhere to those things mm -hmm. and I like to exhibit that. And that might be exactly what you see, hopefully. And, you know, me trying to be smart about how I write a post mm -hmm. and how 
how I divvy up the paragraphs and put a little, you know, now I put a little like an icon or a link on emoji in, in, in there. And that is just to give you a break of how you read my little long, probably long, all overly long winded posts. But that was taught to me in typography because here's a big idea. Take a pause, let it break for a second. And here's, a, you know, here's where it starts to start to parse that stuff out. That yeah. Is how you use type, and I, I I love that stuff. So to answer your question, man, I, I don't get to do it much, but every now and again I get to make something for myself, or it's in the corner of a, one of the posters I made, you know, and you might see a little flash of some of that, you know. Like, um, yeah. So so let me ask you this then: Does print hold a place in this online marketing world? Of course, of course. Of course, you can see you can see who's doing it right. You can see when you go buy their product. I mean, first first of all, someone makes a neat little I don't know, what am I looking at my little wallet, and you go to their site and it's a shitty site and it's hard to read and it's hard to see the prices and it's hard to see what why they made it and it's hard to find the link. Fuck all that. When you see the one where you go see the wallet and there's a little video to talk about how they made the wallet and here's all the prices and here's all the colors and it works on your phone, it works on your thing and it works. You know, that's design. That's design. Call it print, call it dig, call it whatever. No, no, no. It's information set up in a way, you know, that is easy to process. And then I buy a wallet or I don't buy the wallet and it, it did its job. I love that stuff. That's just getting the job done. Now, if the wallet's ape shit, let the wallet be ape shit. If the wallet is just a, you know, I got a little clean wallet here that, you know, my buddy's a tanner goods made in Portland. If that's here, then that's just a little clean tanner wallet. Fine. You know, but the system allows for it to be crazy. Lots of color or monotone. You know, you know what I mean? Like the system. I, 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 I trust that more than trying to be this, you know, uh, case by case ape shit. That, that, that gets a little um, you know, schizophrenic or something. So, you know, when you're talking, you had mentioned Apple earlier when you were looking at the Apple packaging and, you know, even wallet packaging. If you order an online wallet from some e-commerce site, that packaging, that tangible printed experience is an extension of that brand. And that is a point where companies can do it wrong or do it right at this as well. You can have a great website, but if it arrives in a little Ziploc bag, you know, bubble envelope, your experience is less than maybe what you had online. Oh, you, you, you're seeing a lot of this right now. There is, you know, the bait and hook quality to marketing where I got bit by it. There was something on, and I'll never buy a fucking thing from these guys again, but there was something called, touch of modern or something and they they understand the power of a beautiful photograph mm -hmm. and this little nail trimmer set they had this little nail trimmer set and i'm, I'm pulling it out of my shit right now. you hear me digging it out because it looked so nice so nice in this little easily clickable thing and it looked so nice and it was like whoa that's a fair price and it's this and it's that and I'm going to get that. That looks pretty cool. And then when it shows up, it is a hunk of shit. Mm -hmm. And you can scrape the matte coating off with your fingernail. Because, yeah, they, I mean, if you don't touch it, they stay nice and look cool and all soft touch and shit. But the moment you start to actually use the things, you know, that veneer, you know, starts flying off. You get these little paint chips and stuff. And I and I was taken by that. Mm -hmm. Like, that hurts. That, that now I know. To be a bit cynical about, you know, these yahoos who are going to sell you a piece of shit, and then you have to wait six to eight weeks to get it, and it, it shows up, it's junk. Now, now, see, now, in that process, if it showed up and it was did its job, it was a fair price, came in nice packaging or a little bit of extra packaging, I'm on board forever, forever. Mm -hmm. Got me. With just those that little bit of consideration. But no, they took the cheap route, or whatever you want to call it. They took the route that's kind of like, you know, it's a little bit of a sleight of hand. Mm -hmm. You can't really touch that thing like you could in a store, but that's what you're dealing with online. Sure, we're, we're rolling the dice. But I've had things show up that was like, oh, I don't know how to say it. Like, like oh, at first glance, I got rooked. But no, it actually worked. You know, I would hope that if someone buys a goofy little DDC product, that it gets to them safely. Yes, it's a fair price, and we don't, you know, we, we, we maybe muck it up with some creative copywriting, but we're not afraid to say this is a pencil that you write with, and that's all it is, you mm -hmm. know. And it's not, um, I don't know, I, I make fun of these things because, you know, 
but it, it becomes the same thing I'm making fun of. You know, when I call it a, you know, a lead writing apparatus or something, I'm just making <laughs> yeah. you know? No, it's a fucking pencil. It's a fucking pencil. Just call it. No, I have a comb called, you know, the hair organizer. Well, that's because I see people do that and are serious and I want to make fun of it. But then I see people pick up my comb and they laugh. Well, they're good at this job. It's a yes. comb. It gets a reaction. But, like, but then you see people who like actually get behind that and they call their shit, you know, drinking chocolate or something. Oh Jesus, you know, cause then they can charge four times the price, mm. you know? And it's not a, it's not a fucking grilled cheese sandwich. It's a fresh fromage. I've seen that. That was, that was fun. Some restaurant. Anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. Reel me back <laughs> in. Man. Reel me back in. Reel really me back in here. Old. I got a couple of questions, Aaron, that uh, are going to take you down part of your career where you probably made some mistakes, learn some lessons. And I want to pull those stories out for the listeners. Okay. Um, but I'll turn this bus around in the end and you'll end in a happy place. All right. Um, what's been the most challenging time in your design career so far? Why was it challenging and how did you get through it? This podcast, because $10,000 for a half hour is not enough. Okay. No. <laughs> um, uh, let me think. Um, you know, I got to be careful. I don't want to, you know, say anyone's. Uh, no need to name drop or throw anyone no, under the bus. But the, the thing is, it's not hard. Kids, you know, I listen. I talk about something, and kids go read my book, which talked about everything. You know, uh-huh. pretty much everything. You know, and 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 and, and then they'll say, well, "So that when, when I heard you on the thing, you were actually talking about that guy, right?" And it's like, ugh. but I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of something here. Of course, the classic stuff. You know, like a client opened up my PDF in Illustrator. Went and started to tinker on the lines, change the the DNA and the feel and the craft because they could. And what do you do? You know, it's like, wait a second, you just made it worse. And you yeah. try to say that without hurting someone because you want to finish that project. But I started to quickly learn, like, if you want to have, like, check it out. You know, it's like... Um, I don't know how to say it. Like, I had a comedian open his file, change the stuff, because he likes to tinker around. Like It's like me listening to his thing and writing him back and going, you know what, you could make this joke better by doing this. Mm-hmm. Like, I know better than to do that, because that's his magic. It's his craft, like, yeah. You don't do that. And the thing is, is, you know, I make this stuff to where they have instant ownership because I want them to have that. I want them to feel like they can tell me to go right, go left, go up and down. I'm working for them. This is not me placating some ego that I am going to make this for my portfolio. How irresponsible, right? right, right. Mm-hmm. This is me working for them. And then when I give them that, give them, that's a service. They're giving me a paycheck. They're giving me life. They're giving me uh, rent and things and whatever, and insurance bills and shit. They're giving me all that to, you know, to work with. And I provide them a service to where they feel comfortable. Well, this guy felt real comfortable, and then he didn't know what he was doing, and he fucked it up, and then it, it, to this day, I can't look at it, you know? But he likes it, and that means that's like the 95-105 kind of thing. I either got really, really close, and I have to be okay with that. And yes, he took it over the goal line and kind of did a couple tweaks and smeeks and bowls and shits and whatevers, and it sucks, and he likes it and he uses it to this day. So who am I to even, you know, it's like an audience of maybe just me and you talking about it that knows about it, you yeah. know? So that's even like the balance of you a designer understanding maybe it's understanding that you do the designs for the customer as a service to them. And you might not love where it ends up in the end. It may not be the one that really warms your heart. But at the end of the day, it's it's, theirs. It's about understanding the audience and understanding um, what that person wants in the end. I mean, but see, sometimes it just comes down to pissing matches. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, watch this. I can go do this too. I just had a guy do it uh, last last week. And, you know, with all due respect, it's like I wouldn't tell him how to run his, you know – his business. I, I wouldn't, her business. I wouldn't tell her. I, I wouldn't tell her that. I, I would, I would, I wouldn't. That's a, that's too odd. Day. It's too, it's, it's not, it's, it, I'm, I'm out of my lane or whatever the kids call. Yeah. I'm, I, you know, I gotta, I, I gotta get my squad and my bay in order. I don't even know what I'm saying, but no, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fucking, it's audacity. It's just, it's audacity. It's just, it's, it's, it's not cool. And, and, um, um, he didn't see that the other way around and he murdered a couple of designs. And I, what I had to do is I, like, I'm getting, 
the Midwestern in me w- wouldn't just come out and say it. But I, on the phone with him, I mean, we were done. I just said, listen, man, that's not going to work. And I'll show you, but you're not paying me to show you now. You have to trust me. I showed you how it works. Mm-hmm. And here's how you need to think. So what happened out of that, because I was just firm, just in a gentle professional way, he sent me a list of stuff. And I'm going to make another six or seven grand knocking out letterheads, business cards, but the power, power, you know, things and stuff and things and stuff and things and stuff. He's a sweet guy. He's, he's, you know, he's got, he's got the, he's got a really good eye for things. But he kind of murdered a couple pieces. It's like, don't do that, you know. I, mm. wh- and why would you hire me in the first place to get you, you know? What I mean, but that's just how this shit kind of goes. That's frustrating, like anything. Like, you know, when my contractor was here, and we was he was building me the shop I'm in right now. Mm-hmm. And when we would come to an impasse, because he knows me, he knows how I work, because we've worked together in pieces, he would come back to me and say, help me solve this. And I would. I knew my place. I wouldn't go up to him and just say, you're doing it wrong, because he's the he's the guy who knows how to build the damn thing. You know? mm-hmm. But how do you connect the walls? Well, I learned how you do it after watching him. But when we would have a creative impasse where he'd say, here's how I can solve this, he knew to come to me, because it wasn't just about the drywall. It was more like, you know, he understood that, like, I'm going to make a decision because I have to look at it. Mm-hmm. It's not to hurt him. He leaves. He leaves this place at some point, and then I sit here and look at the, you know, the decision we're going to make. So that's no different with making a logo. That's what you get when you trust me to help you get there. This isn't just for my portfolio. I don't need to show that stuff. I'll show the bullshit that you see on my merch site. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of people say to me, I hate the work that's in my portfolio then put some stuff in there that you want to make. Just make stuff. Just fucking do it. Like, who is even going to know? But you have to be responsible and say, here's where I got to work for the quickie. So mm-hmm. I did their logo and I did their things and I worked for this guy and here's what I worked on. Here's what I did. He directed me and you have to be professional to show that paragraph to say, this is the real story. And then when you make your own podcast and it's called The, the Slowest and then, you know, The Slowy. Um, then you go and say, yeah, this is a personal project. Here's what I did because, you know, the people are grazing that stuff. They just want to see nice type. Mm-hmm. They see nice decisions. They want to see how you overlap the K over the E. And I've been watching it this whole time. That's a nice little move. That's a nice little move right there. Hey, that's a shout out to uh, Emily, my designer. You tell Emily to stay the fuck out of Portland, Oregon, man. Because <laughs> down here messing with you. <laughs> Emily, hello, youngster. Hello. Yeah, maybe maybe Emily's 50. I don't know. Maybe Emily's 22. But whatever the deal is, hello, Emily. Aaron Draplin here. And nice type. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, yeah, I feel your pain. A few clients have mentioned that where you know they do some work and they are in love with it. And a client either requests an alteration that they just aren't feeling as right in their gut or a client just goes ahead and alters it themselves and you know dealing with that and trying navigating that well, situation well, well well check it out just to be super clear to redeem myself this is like here's the deal if someone comes back to me in the 11th hour and you know we've got 12 hours to work on it and says oh my god can we change it back to this that is on them i will do it i will do it i will show them here's why it is successful good job Here's why it isn't successful. We probably shouldn't do that. But if you want to do it, do it. I am their instrument. They mm-hmm. use me to do that and to test that. That's my job. But when someone just opens it and says, we're going with this, that's what I'm talking about. That's weird. Yeah, yeah that's, that's weird. on the other side. That's a little bit different. And that's there's a, there's a weird crossing of the line. But you know what? I have to realize they hired me. I didn't go to them and tell them I could do this thing. They came to me, and I have to be gentle with that and professional. And if I want to cry my eyes out because, oh, they fucked up this nice piece I'm going to put in my portfolio, that's the wrong reason to be making this stuff. You're making it for a paycheck. You're not making it to, to win accolades or get some more likes or clicks or some shit. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I don't really show a lot of client work on my stuff until I have their absolute supreme approval. You yes. know, Then I show it. Only then. And even until it's tested, as in not, you know, oh, I just handed it off. Can I show? Of course they want to show it. I got a big ass Instagram with a bunch of people looking at it. But no, we got to let it, you know, have Let's a little see bit. see how it resonates with the audience. Let's just make sure this thing works like we like we built it to do. And then we get to show people wearing the shirts and enjoying the stuff and mm-hmm. things. Yeah, yeah. So, Aaron, do you have a story about a specific design or project that you were a part of that did not go well or bring the desired result? Um. 
No, because I'm really good at this stuff. No, let me. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know, man. That's a really fun question because, of course. But I'm trying to think of like a you know a clever answer. I, whatever. I'm, I'm just trying to think of something that uh, could be a design that you know a presentation that just fell flat in the boardroom or. No, no, well, no. I, I mean, I have to say we have been in a pretty lucky position. Not just me, but some of my colleagues and some of my buddies and some of my whatevers were like, we haven't had to do a lot of pitches mm-hmm. and. You know, we're like, oh, we are competing against other people. Oh, sure. Listen, I've had a couple where like, uh, and I quit doing them. But, you know, you get some hot shit agency turd, right? And you end going, we love what you do. We would love to work with you. Work on this. And then you do it for some pittance. And then you realize they've got six other Aaron Draplins fighting for the same job. That shit sucks. And I'm mm-hmm. done with all that stuff. Because that, that was a younger person's game to like basically spec work. Fuck you guys. Um, but I used to do that, so I didn't know any better. I was it was exciting, and sometimes I won, and sometimes um, here's the deal. In the end, I started to feel bad about it because if I won one or didn't win one, and I knew the other guy, you know, someone would open up and say, "Oh yeah, you beat out so and so." Like, don't tell me that. That guy's my she's my friend, mm-hmm. you know. Or wow, I didn't quite hit it, and now they're snickering at what I did. Well, fuck that. They they just got a bunch of free. You know, when you started to work for Nike in Portland here. And they paid you for for your expiration. That was pretty interesting. You know, you got paid to give it a shot. If you didn't get it, you still were paid well. Sometimes more than you would have got paid for the other logos you worked on, mm. right? And that's an that's kind of a little bit more ethical. But that allows them to you know try a bunch of stuff. They have the money for it. Um, but I'm, I don't know if something specific. I mean, there's been a number of things. I mean, I, I remember doing a, a logo for these guys up in somewhere in BC at a snowboard shop. Okay, and it's one that got away. It's like the best way to put it. But what it was was, you know, it was at this snowboard shop, and I, they they came to me and said, "Dude, you're the dude. You're the one. You know, <laughs> here's where, dude, fucking run. You just need to run, dude. Dude. Okay, okay. So these guys come to me and they say, "Oh man, you know, hey dude, you're the. We we love what you do. What you just do whatever you want, dude. You know this kind of shit. You know you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Or you just be careful. You put your. You better be smart about how you navigate that." Because I, I did, and I showed them why this logo was functional, why this thing had legs, why this thing would work not for one winter, but we're talking for 40 winters maybe. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that's not – they kept steering me towards just, you know, the things that people make jokes about. An X with some initials, you know, the things that people joke about. And the memes that we all oh, ha, 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 we all laugh at this because, no, they're devices that work. And – the thing is, is what no, what they want is they want clever and they want hip and they want you know fashion forward and all this kind of stuff. But I would show them versions anyway. It doesn't it doesn't matter what I show them after a while because they're not going to pick it. They're just going to go pick something off the shelf. And I just probably should have done that. But in the end, I just told them I said, you know what? Here's your money back. You're going to need this more than I, I don't want your money because I can go. You you saw what I'm capable of. But if you didn't see it in the first two or three or maybe even four rounds, then fuck off. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't say that. No. It's like, you, you know, you, you, you're you never going to see it. If you didn't see what I did for you and did well for you right out of the gate because that's why you got – I don't know, you hired me or trusted me. You're never going to see it. You're never going to see it. And I, I just knew that. I just knew that. And I just jumped out, got away, and got back to work on other things and other stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lesson there. It's like this stuff just happens. It happens. It, it, it's it's not bad, you know. It's not, you know. It happens. Well, that's one that got away. And sometimes it's like that. You know, there's been other things that hurt, but I was also paid for my time. There's been other things. I guess a couple things, and I, I would never name this stuff. But there's been other things where, um, um, oh man, you know, like they got it. I thought I did a good job. And then their funding was pulled, and it just died. There's a there's a lot mm-hmm. of stuff like that. that that hurts in, in its own little way, also, you know. Yep. Or the final one, which is just there's been a couple, but I handed off what I thought was a really good solution, and in the end, they made a junk product. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yep. Just was like, oh shit, Drapo, didn't you didn't you go and promote that thing? And this thing kind of sucks. And it's like, oof, that's a that's a real tough one. Mm-hmm. You know that. 
tough one, you know. So, you know, some easier things. But I don't know. I've, like there was one time where I had a big job for Mattel doing this um, dum, 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 packaging for um, like they can't call them guns. They call them blasters, blasters. Yeah. Right. And I did a bunch of packaging and something may or may not have come out of it. But in the end, I did all this work. I was paid well. And then they just couldn't call it a blaster because it was too dangerous or, you know, I mean, in, a, in, a, in a time where these fucking assholes are shooting up America mm-hmm. or what, you know, hort, just bad. We just need to melt all the guns down, all of them down and fuck it, you know, and let them stay in the hands of professionals and law enforcement and not some hillbilly or some fucked up kid who, you know, pried it out of his dad's hands out of his, you know, gun cabinet or whatever, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's where I stand. That shit. But you know, here I am making these big guns that promote. Well, it's fun to shoot a little foam thing at you. You know, that thing kind of died, and I was kind of like, maybe that's okay. You know what I mean? Like, for the most part, I work on stuff that like you know people can kind of get behind. Mm-hmm. You know, you almost so, end up with like a little bit of mixed feelings after something like that. That was one. I mean, I don't. You know, that, listen. You, I, every time I go to Target now and I see all their blasters, you know, it's fun to be 11, nine years old, and run around shooting things at each other. It's fun. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as you get older and you kind of go, well, hmm, you know, what does that promote or what does that mean or what is it? Does that desensitize? I don't know. You know, I don't know. But, mm-hmm. you know, should I just take the money and run? Blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. You know? I, try yeah. to have, I just try to have a little bit of a bone in my body where I kind of think maybe this isn't the best uh, play with my time. And I've, I've said no to a lot of things and might have dodged some bullets, you know. There you go. Ooh, that sounds weird, you know. But yeah, yeah. Anyway. No, I hear what you're saying. You know, you dodged something that ended, would have ended up not being uh, in your best interest. Yeah, I mean, yeah. to answer your question, it's hard when they change it. That's weird. It's hard when it goes. But you know what? You got to be gracious. You have to understand that it could turn on a dime, and you got to be ready for that. Mm-hmm. And then it's your job to help them through it. Sometimes. You know? So, Aaron, what is something you're struggling with in your design career right now? Working too much. Working too much. I, I work too much, you know. Uh, I say yes to too many things. You know, when I'm off this podcast with you, I'm going on another podcast with this guy called the Fretboard Journal. Nice. That's it's nothing bad. I like talking to people. You know, I, I went and checked you out. Looks like, you know, it was quick. You know, I got back to you pretty quick. Definitely. You know, there's a good spirit there. I'll do this stuff. But um, um, I work too much, you know. And what it does is, you know, I went to a wedding last night and we were – there from six o'clock until i don't know 11 o'clock or something and it was beautiful people and happy people and nice and stuff and i find myself sketching in my field notes while we're at the table you know and it's like i can't wait to get home to get back in there and lay out this little patch design like that's just kind of fucking weird man you know i it I look, isn't it isn't though because you know you know what you love i mean I, i'm right but the problem is i mean here's I, I i'm in the middle of a big job right now and at the start of August, the start of August, it was a bit of a, I don't know what to call it. I, 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 I want to say a, it's just a dilemma because like my buddy who helps me get the jobs and helps negotiate things and prices and timing and just watches over me, a little bit of a manager and a little bit of a, you know, helps me negotiate fees when I go speak and stuff. He just helps me, just helps me. That's something new for me because I've done it on my own all these years. But now I have a buddy who's a little bit more savvy with that stuff and he's helped me with that. And it's been pretty cool. He's got some really cool results. Well, at the start of August, a big job falls in our lap and he just has to say to me, didn't you say you wanted your August just to chill, play guitar? You're going on a vacation. You know, you're doing this. I actually went on a vacation. Good for Um, you. You know, didn't you want your August, you know, to, to go see your mom? I, I go back to Michigan on, um, on, on, on Wednesday to go see my mom for a couple mm-hmm. of days. You know, and okay, cool. Didn't you want it? And he goes, you know what? Or you want this big job. What do you think? You know, and it was just kind of like, oh, shit. I wanted my August. And I, I still had my August. But I had an intense one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was sketching the whole time. I'm working the whole time. The first round was handed off a week ago. We just got the feedback for that. You know, whatever. And here's the thing. It came down to this kind of a coin flip. Like, listen, this is a big opportunity. Or you get your time. And you know which way I always go. Of course I take that. Because, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, not sure you want that money. But you want that challenge. And you want that, you know, like you're, 
using your time well and you're earning while you can because at some at some point this will stop for me. You know, I get it. And I have to be realistic about that shit. Mm-hmm. I pretend that I just get to act like a 45 year old the rest of my life. No, that will change at some point. And then I'll hopefully have saved some shit and been smart about things and set myself up, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's hard to say no. It's hard to say no. And I see how it affects my girlfriend. I see how it affects my mom when she's out here. See, how, I, I went home in, in uh, fuck, what was it? I don't know. Middle of June or start of July or something, six weeks ago. And I was home six weeks ago. And I was busy as shit. And I shouldn't have been. I should have been able to just clear. But no, I took the carrot. And I got ahead a little bit farther or paid off my my, I haven't been in debt since 2011. So here's the thing. It's like when I hear people say shit to me, like, well, don't you need more balance in your life, you know, or things like this. And it's like, like, first of all, first of all, balance did not pay my home off. Mm-hmm. You know what paid it off? Kind of grit and busting work ass. and busting ass and all that kind of stuff that we all kind of cringe and talk about. But the thing is, that's the truth. And it's weird but that was the only way I could do it because I don't have a mom and dad I could go to and say, hey, pay my shit off for me. That That's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. My sister couldn't do that for me. I mean, you know, but now it's in this weird position where it's like, you know, like that's what I have. It, this, it, it is not about creativity. It is not about, oh, this typeface is weird. I mean, do I have a hard time when kids rip me off every time because, you know, it's just lazy. you got to go make your own way. I had to. Mm-hmm. I didn't, you know. A couple times I got a little too close to something and I learned my lesson, but that's before the internet, you know? Mm-hmm. Now you see these kids just emulating, fine, if you're 21 years old and in school, fine, but not the kid who's 33 years old who's tweeting like me, talking like me, swearing like me. He's never sworn his life, you know? <laughs> he's swearing like he's acting like, and that's like, no, man, hopefully it's just, it's it's a pile of shit to be an Aaron Draplin anyway. I mean, that's weird third person talk, but no, that hopefully, you know, there's only one of those. And then hopefully there's only one, I don't know, like just within graphic design, you know, one, you know, John Contino and one uh, 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 Gemma O'Brien and one, and there is one mm-hmm. Jessica Hish. It's incredible. And you can't really, you know what I mean? And sure, there's going to be people who try to learn from her. That hurts, but I don't know. I mean, really, the first thing that comes to mind is like just managing my time and um, maybe not saying yes all the time, you know? So. Definitely. Okay, I'm going to turn this bus around for you. I want you to tell me about the project that you've been a part of that you are the most proud of, the one that just makes your heart sing. Field notes, of course. It's awesome. I mean, of course. It, it's What I love about it is it's $9.95 for the most part. Sometimes they're $12.95, but at the very worst, $14.95 for some awesome paper and fun clever you know uh, uh, writing from these guys in chicago my friends you know jim and the gang and then you know some you know logos from aaron drapin or some thinking from aaron Drapen, whatever they are blah, 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 from all of us you know us i'm really proud of that because you can have a nicely designed thing that works and it's a fair price mm-hmm. it's not going to the bank and it's they're 9.95 forever i'm really proud of that because you know sometimes graphic design is only only for those who can afford it and the same paper and the same ink is suddenly a hundred bucks for three of them well fuck that i don't like that stuff i don't like that i don't like jeans that are seven hundred dollars you can get mm-hmm. a pair of ones for i guess 70 it's even hard to say that but mm-hmm. you know eight at the place i go but fine and then I, I mean i my pair of jeans i have in the house i've had them for seven years and i that i don't need one pair i don't wear jeans all the time i mean i rarely wear pants ever but um that, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the stamp I just did for America because a stamp is pretty unfuckwithable. That goes. Everyone needs a stamp, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes graphic design, like I said, is you're making cool shit that oh, you know. I mean, even like within like I love records, and sometimes the records are made so awesome and audio file this and extra packaging that that like I don't want to drop two hundred bucks to get this copy of something. Shit, like. A stamp is something that everyone uses and needs and can afford and needs it needs it and uses it. And I'm just it's a democratization of design and I got to work on one of those. I'm and really it's proud. design that's incredibly accessible. Well yeah. I mean everyone gets to enjoy that little piece of art or whatever, that tribute to Maya Angelou or whatever it's gonna be, you know, or John Lennon or whatever, you know, some Canadian stamps don't even get me going. I'm holding one right now, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Well playing with stuff incredible and that's art that for the people you know really that's you know so is a customs form you know to bring it on back i like that stuff that's design 
for just people who are just trying to get through their lives. And they don't necessarily recognize it, but it's right there and accessible and for them. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm, pr- I'm so proud to have contributed to those couple things because uh, my friend started a, a burger place in town here. Mm-hmm. And it's called Super Deluxe. And it's delicious. And when you go there, it's like an in and out and you're not spending more than seven or eight bucks for your meal. And it's like kind of, it's nice stuff, but it's not $18 for the meal. It's eight bucks for the meal, seven fifty or six forty five or whatever the hell it is for a burger, fries, and a Coke. Mm-hmm. Does not break the bank. And, you know, I work for restaurants sometimes where you go to these places and here's the deal. When you go to Super Deluxe, there are guys, there are construction dudes sitting there eating, you know, their lunch because yep. they can afford it. And I'm so proud of that because they're not at these hot shit places we work at, you know what I mean, and mm-hmm. kind of price them out of it. So I'm really proud to work on things that you know have nice design and a nice experience that everyone can be a part of. That's my favorite stuff. You had said um, stamp design. Uh, I know you're a busy man, but if you listen to episode 55 of the Quickie Podcast, I interview Matt Warburton from Vancouver here, and he did a stamp design for Canada Post that was a tribute to Canadian motorcycles. I will, I will, I will go give it a listen. You know, when I'm working this afternoon, man. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, of course. I mean, it's terrifying and awesome. And you know, to Mr. Warburton, hell yeah. You did it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's history, too, you know. That's right. So I want to get into just a real quick question about some maybe some products and tools that you just couldn't live without. Um, can you tell us a couple of those? Yeah, I mean, in, in what respect? Like you know, like a, like a, like a, like, a, like a ratchet or like <laughs> something on, on the software kind of side of things. So the full question is: What is one design product, tool, website, or community that you just can't live without? So you take that as you want it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, definitely astute graphics. I use that stuff every day. Astute graphics. Get their plugins, little things to clean up points and little things to connect tough pieces of geometry. Beautiful, elegant interfaces. And I don't know, they're 60 bucks. Get them. Astute graph. I don't, I, listen, I don't, I don't work for those guys. I mean, there's been opportunities and things and stuff. I talk about them on my skill shares. But here's the deal. When we're done podcasting today and all this other shit, I'll be using their products. And mm-hmm. the stuff is awesome. And I, I, I need it now. Another thing to think about is a little thing called Better Rename 9. I don't know why it's number 9. Maybe there's a 10 now. I don't know. But I've had Better Rename 9 on my machine for four years. It's a little app. And it is – I clicked it and I'm going to go do the about and see if it tells you what, the, what it says or whatever. But what it is, it's a little doodad to like quickly – um, 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 uh, uh, rename file names and folders like globally quick, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the idea that you, have, you know, in my infinite, you know, dip shittery, you have to touch the file, hit return, enter, you know, type in your thing, make a little system and then go do that. Now you can do it and you parse it and say, add this to this, to this front, replace this thing to this globally across this pile of folders. So what you see is, you know, as shit comes off your camera or something, right? And it says IMG underscore one, two, six, 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 right? Whatever. Mm-hmm. Now you can go in there and say, okay, take the IMG and say quickie podcast sound clips. Bloop, and it plops it in there all nice. And you don't have any extra spaces. You put in a little underscore and you can quickly number things, you know, based on the metadata. And it's it's impressive. It's impressive. You know, so th- it's that kind of shit where it's like, um, um, I don't, I'm, 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 I don't know how to say it. Um, I don't take the bait, you know, um, uh, too easily on a lot of that stuff. It's when someone has a little intervention with me and says, you are doing it wrong. You know, mm-hmm. um, um, uh, 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 why are you traveling with extra hard drives? You know, I had an intervention at Dropbox. At Dropbox. You know, and it was like, what is Dropbox? I didn't even know what, I mean, I knew what it kind of was. I heard the cloud was. This was six years ago. Now, after that day, they were like, you know, here's the deal. We want to see how you work with this stuff. Here is 750. Oh, how big is your hard drive? 750 gigs. Here's 750 gigs. Put your entire world on the cloud. Now... My entire world is on the cloud, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's like that is unfuckwithable. So I talk about that in my workshops, the efficiency of that now. Like I know, you know, here's the deal. You go on the road, I'm on the road a lot. If I lose my someone steals my laptop, 
my shit's intact, right? Uh-huh. Maybe I lost a couple of things that were sitting on the desktop that I couldn't quite, you know, uh, 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 parse into my Dropbox, or it was on the desktop, so it wasn't quite reading yet, or hasn't quite had a chance to upload. Well, that's just go. You lost a day. But you're like ninety nine percent there. Ninety nine point nine million percent is cut is backed up, and that's the stuff. It's like I didn't even know until that day. So, as a product, just being on the damn cloud, being on the cloud, you know, and you know whatever whatever cloud it is, trust that stuff, learn it, get get the one that has the most elegant, yeah, beautiful interface, and then work with that shit. Because now I rely on my Dropbox by the minute, mm-hmm. by the and I you know rip, I'm not sending these big you know, dopey OFish files anymore. You know, no, I'm sending a 2K link. That is awesome. That is efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. So, you know, here's the thing. Left it to my own devices, I will make my own way and might not be the best way until a buddy pulls me inside and says, why the fuck are you driving downtown when you can just build a thing in your backyard? And, you know, and that just washes over me and like, you're allowed to build your studio in your back. That's what I'm talking to them right now. You know, yeah. my commute is 10 steps, not 40 minutes. I know Vancouver's fucked. I know it is. And so mm-hmm. is Seattle and you can't afford it. And, I, and, I, and so is Portland now. Well, I'm not ready to leave just yet. And instead of bitching about it, I love Portland. I love this air and I love this beauty out here and in the Northwest and, you know, all this. I love that, you know, that you know, liberal bubble, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, I'm not ready to go. And I built the studio and I didn't even know you were allowed to do that. You know? So now I know. And that, that's, it. I, you know, there's weird little interventions you get where a guy says, go get better rename, not what, better rename nine. Cause what it was, it was my art, uh, my editor for my, when I made my book, it's my editor. And he said, get this. Cause I see, you know, I'm over your shoulder watching how you're doing these things. And that's kind of a, imperfect way to do it it's problematic you're gonna screw up a file name and i do it all i would do it all the time now stuff comes in it's a little unruly couple clicks and a couple global zim zams and replaces and changes and categories and things and stuff and um, and it's the job's done and that thing was 2.99 five years ago i use it daily Jeez. So. um aaron you've reached the point of the show for the ask it forward question this is where i wrap it all up All right, this is your host, Dave. I'm just jumping in here. I had to record episode 100 before I had recorded episode 99. So the Ask It Forward question from episode 99, my guest Rebecca, um, was dealt with via email with Aaron after the fact. So I just wanted to read his response to that. So Rebecca Cohen's question from Co-Projects Design in episode 99 was to Aaron, do you think that technology is a net positive or a net negative for design and for humanity in general? And Aaron's response via email was net positive. This little phone I'm typing this answer on has shaved time off my design process, allowing me more time to play and tinker. Communication and file management and stuff, that's good. But that's just a stinky little answer how it affects me relating to design, how it affects humanity. I'm not trying to be cynical answering this. I think we're wasting a lot of time just loafing on apps. That freaks me out. I try to watch how much I touch the damn thing. But you know what I like? I like how my mom can FaceTime us out west or how she watched my nephew grow up that way. That's a good thing. Better than a phone call. You can always turn them off, you know? That's hard to remember considering how attached we all are to the stuff. I like it. I leave my phone in the corner of a table or something in my shop and that and it's lost. Fuck it. Leave it lost. All the shit on it will be there when I pick it back up. Funny how we can focus when, when we're not staring at our phones. Thank you, Rebecca, for that great question. Thank you, Aaron, for getting back to us via email with that answer. Now I got a few more Ask It Forward questions I'm going to get to here. I've pulled some Ask It Forward questions from my guests uh, recently who have given you a shout out as their inspiration. So uh, the first one I have for you is from Jordan Kuhn from Brethren Design Co. And let me preface this question because I believe it's from the Breakfast Club where they talk about a bang bang. And that's where you go to a restaurant, you get something to eat, and immediately you go to another restaurant and get something else to eat. The bang bang. Aaron, what is your dream bang bang oh, 
don't even, I, I don't really even know what a bang bang is, but you have to string together two. Like I go to a burger place and I go to a pizza place. Is that, is that what you mean? That's it, man. You go <laughs> restaurant eat know. and some other restaurant and eat. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, important here. It's so easy to get frustrated because you have some fidget who won't let you not have onions on your salad or something. And there's like this weird entitlement of like, you don't like it, leave, you know, kind of shit that we run into here in bullshit Portland. Um, so I'm like a little frustrated with just restaurants. I don't know. I think I would rather my dream. I would rather just be with my mom and dad having, you know, like um, my mom's spaghetti dinner. And then, um, you know, some of my dad, I don't even know. Just It doesn't matter what they just being with them and having mm-hmm. dinner. That's the answer. I mean, yeah, but you know, I mean, I've, I, in the last five months, we've made some changes. I've dropped some pounds. There's been some shit going down. And I would love to just go have a couple bagels like today. You know, I'd like to have a couple <laughs> bagels. But no, fuck Dave. Party's over, Dave. That's right. Okay, if you could get those bagels, what are you putting on that bagel? God, bacon, egg, and cheese all day long. All day long. Well, American, American cheese. The, a Pantone, about a 130 Pantone, I think is what it is. Yep. American cheese. Yeah. Oh, man. I, you know, on my birthday, my sweetheart, my little wildflower, Lee, you know, she uh, she'll make me – Two bagels with bacon, egg, and cheese, and they are fucking delicious. And that's my favorite. But you know what? What I've learned in the last six months, because I got my little secrets around town. You know, I go hit a little drive through here, a little something there, a little something there, whatever. I don't want a life where I can't have a bagel, but I can't have them three times a week. You know, that shit's done. For so. sure. Uh, the next uh, Ask It Forward is from our boy Dalton, uh, art director at Appel Design in Malibu there. And he wanted to know, what is your design album your go-to listen album um while you're just cranking through work his was wow. daft punk live 2007 well Dalton, you're gonna have to rearrange what you listen to because that shit is unlistenable at best but uh <laughs> i'm just trying to help dalton in his quest for um a, a good life um first of all Dalton, you gotta listen to something that's listenable. but let me let me help you with a couple things i don't know i mean listen dalton probably has youth on his side and that's what is gets him pumped up. If I've got to get through something, it just depends on the. It really it depends on the, the time of day it is. I can't listen to some you know da 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 horse shit when it's midnight because I'm I'm starting to like slow down. So what do I get a, after midnight? Well, it's something chill. It might be a band called Low, like slow core kinds of stuff. The Red House Pain or something to calm me down. It, um, but during the day, if it's something to really pump me up. See, the problem with the music that really pump, I always have a record playing, but the shit that pumps really pumps me up, I'll get out of my seat and start doing like recycling. Mm-hmm. I'll get out of my seat and I'll start cleaning shit around me. I'll get out of my seat and I'll, I won't be working. So I don't know. I, I will say this much. Um, I always have a record playing. You can go to draplin.com and just scroll down. You'll see lists and loads of records. I buy a lot of records. and I, I just turned around and the last record that I have sitting on my turntable is this weirdo guy named Robbie Basho, which was kind of weird folk acoustic stuff from the 70s or something. And, you know, some weird reissue. And, you know, just past that is the, um, I don't know, what, what's in there? I don't know, a spiritualized record, you know. There's a couple Melvins in there I can see from, you know, a couple MC5s. So that's all heavy kind of stuff. I don't know. I think the, the better answer is, and I'm sorry for being a dick there, Dalton, but um, it's just having... Um, making time to get up and turn the record over because it's easy to get into the iTunes kind of mode where you're just, you know, um, I, I have my all my records here and I, I, I make time to get out of my seat now mm-hmm. and then find something to pump me up. Does that make sense? Definitely. Versus just sitting on my ass clicking MP3s all day because I'll do that. And it's always, it's hard to answer what that is. A go-to record? Let me, let me just throw one out there. Hit to death in the future head by the goddamn fucking flaming lips. There you go. There you go. You name dropped one. All right. The last one I have for you is from Johnny Vignola, uh, visual designer at Crocs and freelance under JV Creative. What is the biggest failure of your career so far and what did you learn from it? Biggest failure of my career? Um, fucking up my taxes. Um, <laughs> what, what I learned from it? I got I got a big ding. You know, I had to pay a big fee or whatever. I got to pay a big fee uh, error. You know, I had to pay a big fee. You know, whatever. I got, you know, um, what it was was 
it's a two hour story, so just buckle up, you guys. Well, give me the 60 second version. Yeah, here's the deal. I was on the road, a letter came. Every year the letter came, and then the letter would say stuff like this Aaron, I know you're late. We got your thing, your extension filed. Talk to me in September. I don't like doing it this way, but hey, this is how you do it, and you're late. And this was probably 2009 or 10 or something. But we'll, hit, we'll talk after your busy summer, and we'll get this done. We'll have it in by October 15th. I get back from whatever I was doing that spring. There's a pile of mail. I'm on the road. And there's my letter, and I'm thinking, oh, there's my letter from my accountant. He tells me to put another extension. I opened the letter in September, and it says, Aaron, I'm retiring. You're going to need to find someone else to help you with this stuff. And, you, you know, you have to find someone who deals with how sweaty you are and how you do it in October every year. But there is no extension filed. And that year I had what they call a failure to file. Look it up. And I was dinged. And I had a really big year that year of 2010. And in the end, I had to pay $20,000 because of how I fucked up. And that could have bought a car. That that could have been a down payment on a house. It could have helped my mom and dad a lot of ways. It could have been just money in the bank. And that year, I screwed up, had a big penalty, and did the deal, and I learned a big goddamn lesson. You don't dink around with that stuff. Because, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, po- you know um, being in the red or whatever. I can't sleep at night unless I have my, my ducks in a row. And my ducks in a row at that point were doing it, you know, in October and then getting it sent off and then feeling, okay, well – I'm just proud to say 2019, my shit was handed in in February of this year when it was supposed to be April 15th. I don't know what it's like in Canada or you know how you guys do it up there. Um, but April 15th, we have to hand it in, and my shit is tight now. you know, And it's it's been a learning process. So that was a hard one to learn. It's not anything creative. It's not anything, you know, what it is. It's the trappings of being a little bit successful and not knowing what to do. And then I got... But I learned, and I, I, I made my mistake. I paid. I fessed up. I'm Lesson sure they, learned. I'm sure they use that money to drop a couple bombs on a couple of developing countries, these pieces of shit. But um, I don't know. Now I'm pretty good about my, that, all that stuff. So, you know, educate yourself. Get someone to be an advocate to help you. And then, you know, you know do right by it. Yeah. Awesome. So as part of Ask It Forward, Aaron, you get to ask my next guest a question. I'm not going to tell them, tell you who it is, but you can ask them anything. Okay. Um well, I don't know. Let's see here. Let me ask to, to the next guest listening to this creepy question. Um, what's been something that, you know, be it media or a little quip or a little quote or a little meme or a little something that you heard that has just messed with you to the core? And made you look at things a little bit differently in your life. I don't, I'm not talking about design. I'm talking about anything. Because I mean, I have a couple answers. In my middle age here, I'm 45 years old. There's been a couple things that have freaked me out. And from here forward, I'm thinking about shit differently. What's something like that for you? Beautiful. Cool. Aaron, thank you so much for being on the show today, man. We've reached the end of the quickie-ish podcast. <laughs> Extended <laughs> version. Hey, I gotta go because I got a guy. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to this episode 100, both part one and part two. Thank you, Aaron Draplin, for spending some of your busy schedule and your time with us here and sharing some of your stories. It was awesome to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, please head over to iTunes also and leave a rating and a review for the show. I really like reading those. They make me feel warm. They make me smile. So thank you for doing that. Um, And as always, I'll be back tomorrow. See you then.